Welcome to the Witness Africa podcast series. As a response to the restrictions created due to the COVID-19 global pandemic, we have started this series to share helpful information with our community. We will be speaking with experts in the field of video and technology and discussing how to use video evidence in the defense of human rights. Please consider sharing this with someone else and do follow us on Twitter at witness underscore Africa for more. Hi everyone, you are welcome to this podcast series by Witness. My name is Adibaya Okeo and I am the program manager for Africa at Witness. For those who are new to Witness, we are an organization that supports activists and communities to use video and technology in the defense of human rights. And today I have with me an incredible human being, Kelly Matheson. Kelly is an attorney and is an associate director at Witness. She is also the author of the Videos Evidence Guide, which is a resource that helps individuals use videos to expose human rights abuses and bring about justice. I will be speaking with Kelly today about some key tips to bear in mind to make sure your footage is more trustworthy and useful in the pursuit of accountability. So, Kelly, you are welcome. Um, thank you, Bio, for having me and to all of you listening out there. I hope everyone is well and safe. Right. So, Kelly, as someone who has worked extensively in Africa, what are your biggest concerns in relation to the coronavirus and the protection of human rights at this moment on the continent? So, beyond the medical concerns, I'm also deeply concerned that this is going to give states the cover to commit other human rights violations, whether or not that's violence against individuals, whether it's taking the lockdowns and making it, making them too harsh, Mm -hmm. whether it's failure to provide medical aid, whether it's failure to provide sanitary conditions. There's a lot of concerns that go along with a pandemic on the continent. So what we're doing at Witness is helping communities document the human rights violations by the state and by forces because of COVID, and then also the implications that come just because of the pandemic itself. There's a lot of violations out there. So now is the time to do some of the documentation in hopes that we can, one, hold people accountable for the violations that are happening, and two, make sure that they don't happen again and again. Absolutely. Having authored the video's evidence guide, What would you say are the cardinal principles people should pay attention to as they attempt to use video to expose cases of injustice in their communities? I know it's impossible to condense everything into a short podcast, but it would be great to just hear your thoughts. I think the cardinal principles are three. I think the first is that when you go out to film, you film both safely and ethically. Hmm. Safely for yourself, for your communities, for the people that you're filming, and ethically so you preserve the dignity and agency of the people that you're filming. So that would that's the first bucket of, I think, cardinal rules. The second is to film in a way so that your video is trustworthy so that it can be easily verified. And there's some really easy techniques that you can use in order to do that by just adding the time and the date verbally to your video, adding the location, adding small amounts of factual information, but not adding your opinions, staying very objective when you film. And then regarding how you film, it's it's making sure that you get the wide shot, the medium shots, the close-up shots, so that someone looking at the video from far away can tell exactly where it's at, what time it was taken, and what date. The third of the cardinal rules would be to film information that is relevant. And by that I mean if you're trying to prove that the armed forces are using excessive force, you have to think about what exactly is going to show excessive force. Um, You're going to have to show their uniforms, their badge numbers, ideally the identities of the individuals, ideally the weapons they're using, ideally that the civilians that they're using the force against are harmed. So you just really have to make a quick list in your head of what's relevant to prove what you want to prove. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Those are very, very helpful tips. 
So Kelly, as you already know, we have been monitoring how law enforcement agents in Africa are implementing the lockdown orders on the continent. And what we have discovered through video evidence has been disheartening. We have, we have seen excessive use of force and police brutality. But flowing from the cardinal principles you just shared, what are the patterns you are seeing in the videos emerging from the continent at this time and what things are people getting right? Um, let's talk about that first before we discuss what areas in which they can improve. You know, I've seen a number of videos coming out of the continent, probably about 20, and I would guess the pattern of what people are getting right and doing absolutely incredibly well is that they're staying silent. They're letting the footage speak for itself. Mm -hmm. They're not narrating over it. We're able to hear what the police officers are saying or the armed groups. We're able to hear what the victims of the abuse are saying. We're able to hear the background noise, the bullets being fired. And I haven't actually yet seen a video where people are talking over what's happening, which is fantastic. And it's a really good practice to keep implementing. Great. But then will there be times when it might be important for people to also narrate what they're seeing? For instance, if they're far away from the incident they're filming. Yep, it's always helpful to add objective and very precise information. So if you can add the date, the time, the location, and you might want to say, you can't see it from here, but I can tell that it's forces that are dressed in black uniforms. I can't tell whether or not it's live ammunition or rubber bullets that are being fired at the crowd and the crowd is running off to the west. There's approximately 1,000 people present. Adding factual information like that without adding your opinion as to what's happening is ideal. All right, so moving on to the things that could be done better. In some cases, some of these individuals are already risking their lives to document some of these violations, and it's just fair not to expect too much from them under the circumstances because the situation is probably volatile in some cases. However, will there be some things you think they could do better or they should take cognizance of? The thing that I've seen in the, in the videos I've seen so far is if you can stand back and get the context of the situation, the big wide shot, that would be very helpful from a verification perspective. The videos I've seen so far have done a really good job of capturing close details in very tricky situations. For example, in Nigeria, where the forces are going into stores and pillaging and ruining goods. So you can see the uniforms, you can see the weapons, but you can't tell exactly where it's taking place. So if there's a way to step back and keep filming and get the context in addition to the details, I would highly recommend that. That's right. I do agree. So let's talk about the protections accorded to those people recording. We have seen retaliation against journalists by police officers in the case of Kenya, and while professional journalists might have institutional backing coming to their rescue, in some cases, there is no protection whatsoever for citizen journalists, you know, the ordinary civilian witnesses. What would you say regarding, regarding this situation? So in a lot of cases, it's easier for a journalist to record because they have the backing of an organization behind them. They have a lot more training that comes along with their job. But civilians also need to know that they, too, have a right to record. And if you can, during this time of quarantine, if you have access to learning more about filming, that would be one of the first steps I would take. Learn how to film, learn what your rights are, investigate your right to record so that you are starting to build up some of those same protections as a civilian, as a community member, as the journalists have. Right. And of course, for those who are listening, we have an extensive library of resources on the rights to record, which you can access via witness.org. But also just to note, and so we are clear, we are not in any way encouraging people to violate the lockdown order in your country in a bid to document any form of violation whatsoever. Rather, what we are saying is, should you come into any situation where video can serve to expose injustice while you are staying within the confines of the law and you're staying safe yourself, then you should know these are the things to bear in mind as you document the violations that you are witness to. So, Kelly, 
um, can you touch briefly on the issue of sharing the video evidence that people capture during this time? What should people consider before sharing their footage? Oftentimes with video evidence, there's strategic times to share it. You might not want to share it right away. You might want to go ahead and let the officer give their after incident report. And when the video shows something exactly opposite of what they say, then you've caught them. You have shown that they're not credible. You have shown that they will lie on an official report. Then you release the video and you have a lot more impact. So there's a lot of reasons to wait. That's just one of them um, to share the video. To keep your video, one option, just keep it on your phone as is if you don't have any other places to put it. If you do have other physical space to put it, like on hard drives at home, go ahead and download it in its original format there. If you don't have devices at home, but you do have access to a cloud on the internet, but that cloud is secure, go ahead and upload a copy onto the cloud as well as keeping the original copy on your phone. And whatever you do, don't manipulate it or edit it in any way. That is very, very key. No manipulation because if it's been manipulated, it makes it easy for anyone to discredit your entire footage. And maybe I could also add that it's important to protect anyone in your footage who might suffer retaliation from government or law enforcement if the video goes public. So one of the ways to ensure you don't jeopardize their safety is to blur their faces before releasing the footage, but make sure you still keep an original version of the file. All right, Kelly, we have to draw the curtains here. And um, before you go, do you have any final thoughts? So as an organization, Witness and myself are all deeply concerned about the human rights violations that are being justified because of COVID. So if you have the ability to go out and, and document, again, as Bio says, safely and ethically, then please do so because this is unfortunately probably not going to be the last time the world is in crisis. We have a lot of things that we have to learn from this so that we can do it better the next time. And your documentation will ideally help in the short term, but will also hopefully help in the long term if we're ever facing a situation like this again. Right. I have been speaking with Kelly Matheson, an associate director at Witness. Um, Kelly and I, we have been to different countries in Africa to train activists and community members on how to use video evidence in the defense of human rights. And so I invite you to visit vae.witness.org to find out more information. There you will find free resources that give you more insight into video as evidence. Um, and if you, of course, have further questions, please feel free to reach out to us on any of our social media platforms or via our website. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And until the next episode, be safe and stay healthy. Thank you so much, Bio. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, everyone be well. Be well. Bye.